Alex, it's great to speak to you again. I really appreciate you taking the time. You're very welcome. Very welcome, Jessica. It's a pleasure, always. <laughs> Listen, um, I really wanted to, you know, ask a super generic question right from the start, which is, can you talk to me a little bit about how you got into this whole industry in the first place? What drew you to it? Uh, the very honest answer is actually nothing drew me to it specifically, uh, though I enjoy it a lot, of course, and, and, and I'm very grateful to it now. I started as a child very, very young to take pictures and I was obsessed I got my first camera when I was seven. I started selling pictures to kind of indie magazines by the time I was 14, 15. I was seriously, a little bit seriously working while I was in school for a couple of magazines. And, and, and I really intended to do that. And then I came across a fashion designer in my past of taking pictures when I was um, 16, 16, 17. And uh, seven, yeah, 16, 17. And I loved what she did. And then, make a long story short, her name was Sibylla. I was in the late 80s, early 90s. I started working with her. Well, it wasn't even called work yet, but I was helping her with ideas and very, very uh, uh, spontaneously so, because I had no idea about what that world was all about. I didn't know anything about fashion and was not attracted by fashion at all. And one episode kind of drew me. Uh, a little bit, which is I'm very impatient and very ADD, and I was very young, but nevertheless already pretty ambitious and pretty speedy and pretty impatient. And I um, came across a photographer back then named Javier Valandrat in Spain, um, we're talking 30 years ago when I was a kid, and I um, was on a shoot with him for a magazine about Sibylla, and I started helping him on the shoot, and I was so mesmerized by the level of his creativity and achievement in photography that was so much ahead of where I was in my photography. And in the meantime, I felt that I was already quite ahead in what didn't even have a name yet, but of doing what I was doing in helping her and doing our direction of the shoot and thinking of ideas with the clothes and whatever, that I think for some reason at some point that day I realized that Maybe if I diverted my past a little bit from a still 2D photograph to a 3D and four dimension experience, I could probably use the same skills that I loved by doing a photograph. I could use many more and I probably could get there faster than the time I felt I had on my hands. And I diverted that day from wanting to strictly be a photographer to not knowing what I wanted to be and still not knowing today but applying my point of view and my kind of wish and ability to design a situation and an experience and an image and let it be photographed by others. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what happened. <laughs> it's interesting because when you when when people, even I think on your website, they don't you don't really have it like a defined name, you know, there isn't like art director or produce, you know, there isn't really something to define you because there is so much going on in, in what you do. But so for, so it was more, it is all about the image or it's more about the experience? You know, you're talking it about- both. It was both, it started by the image, it started by the control of the image. Mm. Uh, I think I even started by taking pictures by first assembling my robots and my objects in certain ways and then shooting it and then playing with the picture. And then I had a dark room and I studied uh, uh, um, developing and I would start doing kind of Man Ray-ish special effect of my prints to control even more the result of the picture. And I think it's all the same. I, I, I sincerely believe and always have believed that creativity and inventivity, if you have it, even if you don't know you have it, could apply to anything. And then there is the craft. Some people are amazingly talented and agile with their hands mm -hmm. in crafting some things, others in painting or drawing, others in writing, others in sculpting. Well, I had none of these. Unfortunately, I have none of these qualities. I was really bad at all of them. So I guess I had to invent my craft. And in a way, the experience mixed with the control of the image became a craft and it became a way to expressing that creativity. And I still believe today that it doesn't really have a name. Yeah. But actually, if we push it further, I believe today that it shouldn't have a name. I, I have always been uh, impressed and attracted by pluridisciplinarity. Mm. I think the most talented of creatives should and could and can be pluridisciplinaries. Uh, um, in the fashion world, weirdly, 
Well, not really. There is a reason for that, but there weren't that many. I mean, there are many more today. There was Karl Lagerfeld. He was the yeah. most multidisciplinary man of all of that world. Um, there were many in the Renaissance times, but because they were slower times and they spent their life exploring various crafts. Mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, I guess our world, creativity got mixed with commerciality and with uh, 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 result and with uh, quantity and therefore maybe there was less time to explore other crafts and, and therefore there is less uh, pluridisciplinarity. Also because people like to put you in a box yep. and they like to not have to think too much about what you're good at, mm -hmm. that they can use you always for the same thing. I've always been completely against that and I still am more than ever. And I think we're at the start of a new world in the new century where hopefully there'll be more freedom for creatives to reinvent the names and use the changes in the world to reinvent themselves. I love that idea. I, I hope so. I know that for a lot of people this last year has really, you know, put a lot of things into question and, and thinking about different ways to be creative is definitely one of them. So talk to me then about that, that evolution. How did it go from, okay, so not just photography, but for creating an environment that's engaging on, you know, on different sensorial levels to, to actually this idea of shows or events or how did it, how did it morph into being so involved in the fashion world? I mean, I just want to talk about the evolution, I guess. I think it went both naturally and weirdly. When I started, I mean, I started, as I said, very young. At 17, I finished high school. By the time I had finished my back, I had already started working, both for magazines, originally as a photographer, but then more as an art director of a piece that I would help Sibila put together, whatever. And then I opened my first office, which did not have a name nor an activity. Uh, in fact, back then I was thinking, okay, I need to do a business card and I need to look more serious. And I was uh, hardly 18 when the first office opened. And I remember I would buy uh, Halloween uh, hairspray cans and, and gray, and I would spray my um, uh, my side, what do you, what do you side burns. They have like a little gray yeah, in there. Like side burns <laughs> in gray. And I was wearing 1940s uh, double breasted uh, suits. And, 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 and I was looking very serious, but very weird at the same time. <laughs> so that I could get, make myself be, be respected and be, be taken seriously. And that was in Paris. And, and, and it's unusual here to be so young doing whatever it is, in fact, doing anything. And, um, and so I started my first office right away. One of my clients was a fashion designer. Then I took another client, which was a, a jewelry designer. Then I took on another client, which was a, a model agency in Tokyo for whom I was doing scouting of weird models. And I would accompany them to Tokyo. Uh, to try to understand what can be done with a different uh, aesthetic of uh, uh, talent. Uh, for that same agency, the guy was a collector of antique sports cars, so I would uh, look out for sports cars and bring them to Tokyo. Um, what else was I doing? I was doing some photo uh, art direction for Ley and Per Louis. It was going all over the place and there was no name to it. And then, and then very quickly, I decided to move to New York and to specifically uh, and when I got to New York, it was the beginning of um, New York Fashion Week. I mean, the, 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 it was the beginning of the international New York Fashion Week. It was the beginning of the tents in Bryant Park. Yeah. Uh, it was the early 90s. And until then, American fashion designers had shown in their showroom quite intimately, not really internationally. Um, but in the beginning of the 90s, uh, New York picked up. It was a big economic crisis following the Gulf War. Uh, Europe was in, in, I mean, especially France and England and everywhere in Europe was going really down and America picked back up really quickly. And, and a lot of people started moving there, including myself. And it was a, 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 a moment of change in trends and in ways and in fashions where we were coming, I was coming from having grown up in Paris and being more into indie everything, including indie fashions. It was the start of the androgenity, the start of the Japanese fashion designers the aesthetics of Comme des Garçons and Yoji. Um, it was also the start of pre-Raphaelism and Romanticism. While America was still in the mid eighties, in a way, you still had those big shoulders and girls turning on runways. Like there yeah, was- Yeah, yeah, the cameraman on the side and, you know, and, yep, and, yeah, I remember. Yeah, it was, it was a completely different aesthetic. It was, it was Dallas and Dynasty. Yep. And, and so when I arrived, I was like, gee, there's a lot maybe I can do here. <laughs> And I just started knocking on doors and say, hey, you know, I'd love to do things together. Like what? I'm like, I don't know, your fashion show. <laughs> I could have said anything. And, 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 and it kind of started like that. And, um, and I think, I, I don't even know if I said fashion shows. I said, whatever, whatever, whatever. I, there was no name. Whatever could use all the senses, whatever experience I could 
I could I could contribute to creatively that that that, that you know that will touch all senses and that has a creative necessity to it. And and the first one of them was fashion shows because yeah because it was starting the stunt was just starting and not that they were the best thing ever but at least they had the merit of existing and in the meantime as I said the rest of the world in the creative worlds of fashion and others were in economic crisis so there was more to do there than anywhere else and uh, and that's how I started. Now you have like a huge I mean you have offices around the world you have a huge team I, I do talk to people who are in creative fields who find themselves more and more isolated from the creative part of, granted that's at the essence of what your companies do, but how are you able to keep your, you know, feet in the water? Like, how are you able to maintain not getting bogged down by being the big boss in relationship to, to your creativity? It's a really good question. And I think it's everybody's problem. And, 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 and I guess in today's world, I think in today's world, creativity, unfortunately, cannot be well, in most cases, cannot be separated from the practicalities of life and business and work. Um, some people manage to remain strictly artistic when early in their life, they found a partner, by lack of a better word, that started with them, like Pierre Berger with Mr. Saint Laurent, for example. And there are many couples like that, mostly as couples, but there are many binomes, binomies, binaries. So one does business and the other one does, does creation. I uh, started alone, so I had to do it all. I mean, I very early on started a team and I have a fantastic team and, and, and that also, you know, that helps me with most of that. And in addition to a fantastic team, I am the chance to have a fantastic wife who also helps me with a lot of that. I mean, we, 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 we just, you know, we're, we're staying on the ground and we're sharing problems, especially the types that you don't necessarily solve alone. Mm. I mean, funny enough, I think that my creative problems, which are in, in a way for me, the most important ones, my creatives, uh, block. So when you have to a deadline that you agreed upon, and tomorrow you have to come up with the best idea ever for this or that, and and it still doesn't come, that's that's what I try and want to keep as my biggest stress. And I think it's the one that matters most is where I can ultimately creatively innovate again and solve and whatever. And then the rest, the rest is huge because yes, you're right. Now I have more than 50 people. We have offices in, 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 in Paris and New York and Shanghai and LA now. Yeah. Uh, we do things all around the world. And, and, and obviously big clients and big budgets and big and, and all the big problems that goes with all those big numbers. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the great, the best answer to you is. Uh, I do, with no false modesty, believe that I've managed not too bad to reconcile both. Mm -hmm. I guess I very often, it's funny, sometimes I, I tell you what happens as well with some people. Non-ability non, non solves you from having to solve what you're not able to. And, and it's unfortunately not my case. I have a lot of artist friends and I have some similar to me that kind of handle both mm -hmm. and I have others unsimilar to me that are purely artistic and have no consideration for practicalities of life, not, none whatsoever. And in those cases, many rely on their agents, their managers, their gallerists, and maybe their family and husbands and boyfriends and wives and God knows what. Um, but that's also because they never really developed the necessity of the ability of the practicality. Unfortunately, for some, or, or fortunately, I grew up uh, with a very strong ability to manage and to solve and to direct and to do all those things that are required when you do what I do today in the management side of things. And for some reason, I guess that gave me the ability to not be too bad at it. Mm -hmm. And once you're not too bad at it, then people expect from you to do it. If you're really bad at it, they don't expect from you to do it. So yeah. for that reason, <laughs> I end up having to sometimes think uh, 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 yes, of course, of logistics and practicalities and business and money and budgets and, and feasibility. But again, I try when I put myself in a creative only mode to start by always dreaming and forget about all of the practicalities and first try to think of what would make me dream, make my surroundings dream, make you dream. And, 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 and I, I think I talk about uh, that specifically because you know the stuff that you've done with Dior, you know, the, the very striking things that I remember for um, Rodarte, amongst others, come to mind. Very, very different, and of course, you would expect that from somebody of your level. Um, 
but talk to me about like, is there, is the goal not to have anybody recognize that it's, you know, Alex behind this, or is, is there something that identifies the work that you do within the industry? There is, I mean, there, there's no goal, but I mean, there's no goal, but there is, it's, it's understood. I, um, I mean, I believe that obviously my work with fashion houses and designers together with my team is to help them define their visual image and their visual DNA and to help them grow in it. And it's to creatively, it's to bring our creativity to their needs. But obviously when you do that creatively as I do with my team, you can't but do it from the heart and from yeah. the soul and from, it's not just, uh, uh, and, and, and by definition, then it becomes part of you as well and you become part of it as well. So I do understand and believe that in, in most of the most groundbreaking work that we do and that I've done, that there is a very Alex the taxing in it. Even though there is before that a very Dior, a very Rodarte, a very, I don't know who you name, Saint Laurent, whatever, I mean, any, any one of them. Um, it's a mix of both. And that's why it's interesting. That's, that, that's, that's what made interesting that job in a way, is that um, it's, a, it's a mix of the creativity that I can have and bring, the one that I receive from the designers and the houses, and the, and the result that it's a mix of both. And, and, and also it's very fast and it has a date and a, and, I mean, and a place. You know, it, it, has a, a, it has all of that in, into yeah. one thing. A lot of people, of course, especially over this last year, you know, have moved into like, what's digitally possible? Um, what can we do in this domain? Um, but I imagine you have to be inspired all the time from everywhere. There, there is a point that people get into their careers where you get into that rut or, you know, like a designer has been working for 10 years, they've got their staples, they know what works, they continue to use that. How do you pull yourself out to look to other where areas? Do you count on your team to help bring you new ideas? Do you, are you always out at museums, always reading books? Are you, I mean, what's your kind of way yeah. to keep yourself? I guess a mix of all of that, a mix of all of that and more. I mean, I mean, uh, as I said, luckily I have a fantastic team that of course shares with me the brief and, 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 and brings, and of all different ages, by the way. That was my next question. Like, what are you looking for in the, like when you're looking to hire somebody new to staff? I'm, when I looked, I mean, well, I didn't answer your yeah. first question. To finish your first question, the answer is everywhere. And, 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 and I've said that before, it's not no news, but I think inspiration starts from within and then from curiosity. Inspiration starts from having the ability to, to keep curiosity on everything, including everything you see every day and being open-minded enough to change your uh, judgment on it or to change your uh, uh, um, uh, prejudices on on it you know I mean you can think you've always disliked red and then suddenly you know start liking it and and, 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 and the same goes for everything so even if you walk the same path every morning from A to B on that same path there can be the same thing that evolves through the seasons and that can inspire you differently because you've helped your mind be open enough to changes mm -hmm. uh, that's the basis I think of the inspiration so, I mean, and, and then of course, then more traditionally, I dig into my books and I cannot stop and I've never stopped since a very early age to get a lot of them and buy a lot of them and they're everywhere and it's a mess, they're everywhere, there's piles everywhere. Um, and some of them I've had all my life and others I just got to, you know, today. And, uh, 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 and, 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 and whether we, you've had them forever and looked at them forever, you can still look at them and find new things in them because you're looking for something else. And then it's, it's, well, and nowadays, of course, there's Google and there's whatever, you know, and, and, and all sorts of uh, research on the web, but which is great, it's brilliant, but you have to let yourself get lost as well. If you don't get lost, then you end up on a stupid Pinterest page, which is the same that everyone else has been looking at, yep. and, and, and there's nothing new in it. Um, there's amazing things on the web and on Google and YouTube and everywhere. If you let yourself go somewhere else, but, but but where you want, you know, where yeah, you down that rabbit hole. Yeah, uh, that's super important. And and in general, weird books and weird resources and weird places and traveling, of course, which mm -hmm. I'm very lucky to be able to do, um, was <laughs> uh, 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 inspires a lot. And then and then just 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 anything. And to go back to your second question, what I look into with new people when they come to look for work with us is precisely that: is the richness of of their culture. Um, I don't look into them to come and do what we already do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, I mean, 
the abilities to well do the job they come for is a given. It goes without saying. I mean, on a, on a resume, if someone comes for a job in production or in design or in architecture or in whatever, that the basis has to be there. Yeah. But what's interesting is the extra, is the thing at the bottom of the resume, is their, their passions and their interests and the other stuff they'll bring to the plate, whether they have an amazing ability in a craft that you don't even think existed or uh, uh, in cooking a certain thing or in uh, growing a certain anything. I mean, in fact, I think what really, and, and that's something in today's world, which is very hard to find. Um, again, there's too much pragmatism. I think the youngest generations, and especially in the States or in Europe, I mean, in the places we live in, are being maybe raised into too quickly wanting to succeed and make money and be successful, whatever that word means, in doing what they think they'll do. Um, I always tell them, dream, you know, when you come, you're 18, you're 20, 22, 24, 25, it doesn't even matter, matter the age. When you come and you start and you think you want to enter a field, dream and invent. Don't come with what we've seen a hundred million times. Don't come with demonstrating that you can do a fashion collection that will sell millions tomorrow or a, a, a show that will attract or an exhibition or whatever, uh, however many. No, bring me something crazy. And, 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 and hopefully highlight the stuff that you think was not necessary that you've accumulated in your life and in your past, meaning whether it's the sports, the cooking, the, the planting, the what I said, the, yeah. the whatever passion you had as a kid that hopefully that you sometimes put at the bottom of the resume and then makes all the difference with the other guy. Yeah. Uh, and the other girl, it, it's that, it's all, the, it's your political interest, it's the stuff you read, it's, and what we're really looking for, what I'm really looking for is this, is the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Basic no, I, I, I keep telling my kids, I'm like, I, you know, I took a year off between high, you know, high school and college, go see the world, get lost, yeah, you know, discover. Get lost. Exactly. Get, get lost. Get lost. And it's, and, and funny enough, I grew up in France and in France, there's no such thing as gap years, unfortunately. I don't understand this in France. My husband is like, no way. And I'm like, of course you want to take a year off. The only reason we met was because I took a year off, you know, so you never know. No, no, you're absolutely right. The timings are a bit different. I don't know why. I mean, uh, um, the, 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 the structure. Well, I'll tell you why also, because France has a couple of reasons. France has the plus and the minus, like, like everything else, the quality, the defect of its quality. It's a very ancestral culture. It's very old. It's very protected. The capital, Paris, hasn't been bombed, which is a great thing. So it's very beautiful and very historical and very old. And, and as a result, nothing evolves quickly in yeah. the mentalities, in the systems, in the politics. And the school system in France is both very good and very old. It's very good as in the level of a kid that finishes high school at 17 with a back is really, really high compared to many others. Absolutely. But sometimes it's really rigid. <laughs> it's like it's... It's well, tell me this. Well, this is one of the like questions that. I wanted to ask you was about your own kids. How, as someone who's such a creative spirit, as somebody who's books and art and travel and all of that, how are you breaking, casse that frigid, you know, structured way of French life and, oh, yeah. and, and making sure that they have the same kind of upbringing that you have, where they can have that kind of seeing the world in so many different ways? I think it's, 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 there's no great answer to that yet. I mean, I have, I have big boys, I have teenager boys, and then I have a little beautiful baby girl, the three-year-old. Um, what I consciously maybe have done is obviously traveled with them a lot, to, taken them with me on a lot of holiday trips, on work trips, on work experiences, on shows, on this and that, on, on construction sites, on kind of everything, just hoping that the more I give, uh, as options of knowledge, the more they'll be able to do with it after. Uh, I'm obviously, I, I didn't study myself, so I had no, um, and one of them does, and one, well, actually, they kind of both do now, but one does, one didn't, uh, it does, whatever. Uh, I have no preconceived ideas for or against any of it. Mm. Um, however, because I never studied, I mean, I did school and I finished high school, but I had even started my work before I finished high school. So I really had no, no idea. No, I mean, no, no higher, higher schooling kind of stuff. No higher school and no, no knowledge of anything specific other than what you get at 17. Yeah. Um, and in a way, in a way it, it, it helped me in a way it participated in the, in the freedom and the, and, and, and the, and the freedom of my mind to maybe create and invent with no basis. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started doing an event or a fashion show or an exhibition or whatever, I'd seen some of them, but I'd never learned any of, a, anything about them. I knew nothing about anything. I knew nothing at all about fashion when I started. Or, so or, ignorance is bliss is what you're telling me. Yeah, I mean, I don't, ignorance of the specifics. I yeah. think the most culture one can have the best and there's no limit and, 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 and you can never have enough. Mm -hmm. But it's also good to not be taught too many rules and customs and specifics of what you'll do as a craft later, because it might restrict you. And if you don't know any of it, you learn what you need to learn and you won't be too restricted by what you didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and, 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 and when it comes to education and kids, and I have a few, <laughs> um, I sometimes don't, I mean, my, my you know, uh, I push them in both directions. I mean, one, one studied in university in America and, 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 and loved it, but then COVID uh, you know, came, so that stopped, so he came back. Now he's working and I'm pushing him to do little internships and experiences in, in a lot of different things, in anything but what he studies. Yeah. So that's something else. And, 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 and again, I've no, I don't think there's a specific rule or recipe. I mean, I think studying can be amazing if you can if you can in all senses of the term, if you're patient enough, if you can afford it, if you can afford the time, the money, and if you are looking to get into a field that requires more specifics than others. Yeah. But even that is changing. The world has changed. I mean- uh, I, want, I do want to talk to you about that part of it, the, you know, because I can't have you get off this call without asking you about what this last year has been for you and specifically with your job having to do something that is innately about bringing people together and having those experiences and what this year has been like and how you've been evolving you, you and your company. It's very well put. Um, I did get into that job partly for the reasons I said at the beginning, which is I can use all of the creative crafts I want and partly because I can touch all of the senses mm -hmm. in a live manner to, uh, to an audience of humans that we experience it. So yeah, it has been, um, how can I say, hard and interesting at the same time. Uh, obviously, the world was evolving in that direction before COVID. COVID accelerated a change that was, uh, in a way, needed and bound to happen, needed or not. It's just a course of things. We're living in a world that's going more and more digital, more and more virtual, and that's nothing new. However, the fact that suddenly we were forced to turn every live experience into a digital and virtual only. That was new. Yeah. Um, it was, and, and, and well, it was hard lived and, 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 and well lived. We were lucky enough to have started Bureau Future, which is the digital content creation agency a few years ago, four and a half years ago now, um, because I saw it coming anyways. I did get into what I got into because I like the live and the audience. But I also understood many years ago that if we didn't augment digitally better the live experiences we're giving our clients, there would be no more clients and no more live experiences because yeah. the reality of the economy of it is that it's not worth spending all that time and energy and money and talent into the 500 printed media live uh, audience you have if the millions that sit digitally only don't sit better than the print than, than the ones that are sitting there. So we had to reverse that machine a few years ago already. I was sure of that. And I said, guys, we're, you know, it's going to be the other way around. Until now, we were designing live events. And one of the <clears throat> suppliers was the uh, filming guys who come and, and stream. Um, the reality is we're going to work for them and not the other way around. You know, in, in very, very soon, the only reason of the existence of those shows and events will be the streaming of them and the digital uh, 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 and virtual uh, living on them and not the other way around. However, I strongly believe, and I've always said, that even digitally only, and even for a non-professional audience that sees it digitally on their phone, on, on, on Instagram or wherever, whatever uh, 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 channel, when there is a live audience, you manage to transmit a live emotion, which is what gives an interest to that scene, that show, or that event. And through the live audience, not just through the way they post, just through their being there, and of course they're posting and all that, there is a, a, a form of interest, of emotion, of stress, and of liveness that for some reason I feel we managed to have transmitted better than what we've done lately when we had to agree on the fact that there would be no live audience at all, at all anymore for now. Yeah. This past season, 
So it's interesting what happened because in one year we had, until a year ago, the normal shows with the worldwide audience traveling everywhere, sitting 500 to 2,000 people in a room, and that's live transmitted on uh, social media. However, it was live transmitted in a way that wasn't really well looked at by the industry because the industry was their life. So they really yeah. didn't care. It was filmed, it was okay, some better than others, whatever. Then obviously COVID arrived and we started uh, the live shows the following season, but with no audience or hardly no audience. But we were already, we were still live shows because, because we were in the habit of the live show, because it was a calendar, because there is talent, because there is all these uh, parameters that we hadn't changed yet. So in June, July, there was a small window where we started doing a few shows for Dior in, in Lecce, for example, with no audience at all, for Jacques Mus in the wheat field with a little bit of audience. And, 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 and we started to understand the, the importance of how we transmit digitally, because it's, it was the only way everyone was going to see it, including the traditional professional audience. And then in September, we had a small window of a few shows in Milan and Paris with a very, very small live audience, only local, and the rest of the professional audience was entirely virtual. Yeah. And then in January, February, Couture and Ready to Wear, we knew getting into it that there was going to be no live audience at all. So then we stopped doing live shows because there was no point, because there was because you could film better and differently if you're not live anymore. You could film over, you can take more takes, you can add cameras on stage, which we never do when we're live. You can take a day or two or even a week, some in some cases to edit. Mm -hmm. um, you can retake, I mean, there's a million other things. You can add additional content. There's a million other things you could do when you know getting into it, you were not live anymore. Yeah. And what we learned, we learned many things. We obviously confirmed, at least to me, the fact that that a live event without a live audience, even though we, we, we managed to be more creative on film and do amazing things, the life part of it is boring and sad and not very efficient when the emotion doesn't travel through a live audience and only travels through a phone. Uh, in fact, there's hardly no emotion. And what I've always said, when there's no emotion, there's no memory. And when there's no memory, there's no success. I mean, I, 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 I dare you um, to tell me as, as precisely your memory all of, of all those shows you've just seen virtually the past few weeks versus the ones you went to. Absolutely. I mean, no, the ones that you were, you were at, you know, the, the ones of Dior at Versailles, the, you know, the, the Prada shows, the, all of them, anything that's in real life, but they're, the impact there, whereas this last season just kind of floats by on the ether, the ones that you didn't yeah, actually blurs. But, but, uh, but the good side of it is that there's a lot of great sides to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted that hopefully that bloody uh, virus uh, ends and that we will at some point not do the same and not go back and I'm not nostalgic at all, but that we will do live experiences and shows and events again. Mm -hmm. We will have learned that first of all, we can, for all the ones, I mean, uh, I've said for a long time, not everyone will come to everything ever again, ever. This is over. That yeah. time completely ended. It was bound to end slowly. It ended fastly because of COVID. Fine. Uh, from now on, we'll be more local. We'll be a bit smaller in live amounts of professionals needed. We'll be a lot larger in live professionals virtually or online only, and way bigger with live audiences that are not professionals worldwide. Uh, that had started a few years ago with Instagram, but now has grown way bigger because of COVID and because of how used people are to be more even on the screen, unfortunately. So we learned how to transmit digitally better. We learned how to film the fashion shows better. Mm -hmm. Granted, some examples I just gave you, um, because there was no audience, we could do retext and we could do a lot of tricks that you use in the, in the, in the film world that you cannot use in a live world because you're live. <laughs> when we're going to be live again, we're not going to go back to filming poorly as we did before we were uh, doing it now. We're going to want to continue to exercise the same level of quality and inventiveness that we've had this past season. So it's going to be a new challenge. How do we do a live show with a live audience that's posting already and still transmit it digitally much better than we used to as well as we just did but without the ability of editing overnight and of having other takes. We're gonna to have to do it live. And that will be very interesting 
That's going to be a very, very, very interesting challenge. And I know Alex, you are up to the challenge. Well then, so then, you know, the other side, the other aspect of, of your career and, and your focus, especially it's been a year now that you did your 10 commandments, um, you know, in focusing on sustainable aspects of the way you do your shows or the way you run your company. Uh, granted, it was the most crazy year to decide to go more sustainably, um, mm -hmm. but maybe it also underlined the absolute need to do something like that. Do you feel like um, you've succeeded so far in the goals that you wanted to do? You think you're going to be able to, or that the world has shifted and that's the way we're going to have to go in the future? I mean, what's your shakeout with this idea of sustainability? Yes, 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 and a little no. Okay. Uh, all the yeses are, we were, I mean, it was a coincidence, even though there's no coincidences in life, but we, we announced our sustainability objectives and, and, and our Ten Commandments uh, end of February, so the, just before COVID uh, lockdown last year, because that was the time we received our ISO 2121 certification for eco-conscious events production after years of working on it. It just so happened that we finished then, and we were ready to publish and to announce to the world then how we're going to help solve that problem. Um, the, 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 the 10 first commandments was our first tool to lower our carbon impact and to do more eco-consciously what we already do. Uh, the next steps were going to be, which we announced back then, that before the end of 2021, we would publish an open source manifesto with all the resources in it to share with the world of how we managed, not only through the Ten Commandments, but with the precise resources and addresses and whatnot, on how, and technicities on how we managed to lower our carbon footprint this way. Mm -hmm. And the other um, uh, thing we announced was the creation of a do tank with a board that would be comprised of a more scientific uh, 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 people and more uh, entertainment and fashion people. And the entertainment and fashion would help raise some of the questions in addition to the ones we already had that maybe they have. We will translate them the way we did in the first part of the work to the more scientific uh, people so that we can turn those uh, uh, questions into uh, specifics that maybe we can get the help to get an answer to and a solution to and then transmit it to the rest of the world through the manifesto and through the ambassadors we'll have in the board, uh, in the do tank uh, board committee. That's something we're working on. Um, unfortunately, what did happen with COVID is that, first of all, um, everything slowed down. Everybody's projects, every company's, every designer's. So it didn't get forgotten. Uh, it's still a very top of importance topic within all the big groups and the big brands and within our uh, organization. Nevertheless, the processes have slowed down a lot, just like everything else. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. So we're but we're still doing okay in terms of the timeline we had, we had committed to. We're still applying um, uh, 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 our guidelines and our commandments to everything we do. However, it was made much more difficult because, of course, as you have noticed, with COVID came a resurgence of single-use plastic, for example, everywhere, a bloody nightmare from the plane where everything is wrapped in single-use plastic to the restaurant where they give you plastic this, and plastic that well before they close. Now there's no more yeah. restaurants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, but, but that, that sanitary freakness of that of that uh, COVID. I mean, just masks alone that are not yeah. recyclable. Yes. And and what it did besides producing a new mass of single-use plastic is that all the work we were doing and everyone else that's working on that were doing on the on the awareness made and not only to kids but to everyone about, for example, single-use plastic was killed in one go by all this plastic they throw at you now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a, of, a, of a backlash. And unfortunately, and the other one is that the economy, not quite yet, but we will suffer. The world economy will suffer. And by definition, even though the big groups and the luxury brands have done pretty well, even during yes, COVID, I believe that at least activity, all activities will at some point suffer. In Europe, most France first and many other countries have tremendous help uh, from the governments mm -hmm. to survive these lockdowns. But that's gonna stop at some point. And very sadly, the day it stops, there will be a lot of disemployment and a lot of, I mean, and a real new economic crisis. And of course, during economic crisis is not the best time to convince people to spend more money to do better. 
Yeah. But again, we're committed. We're not going to let go, not one second of it. It's a topic at the top of every presentation we do. Anytime we start working on an event, an exhibition, or anything, you know, we, we, we meet, we brief, we create, we think, and then we put a presentation together. And all presentations that have been coming out of Rebetak since our announcement a year ago have always started with our uh, sustainability and eco consciousness commitments. And we're not going to let go a, a, a second any of it, but it's just made a little bit harder because well, of I, I have no doubt. I mean, I can hear the term, the ter I can hear the determination in your voice. So I'm I'm glad, and I hope that you will inspire others to to go in the same way that you're going. Um, all right, so I'm kind of excited about this. This is my five generic fashion questions I've asked everyone I've ever interviewed. Um, so I'm going to ask them to you, and I'm curious to see what you come up with because you know you're not a fashion designer, so I'm interested to see what you'll say. So the first question I ask everyone is, what is your favorite piece of clothing that you own personally? Probably, I have a few. Uh, probably my uh, um, my old creeper shoes <laughs> from when I was a kid. You're wearing? <laughs> I'm wearing them now. I'm wearing them all the time. Um, a lot of. I've accumulated obsessions through my life. I've added many, many new ones, but I've never gotten rid of any of them. So in <laughs> other words, most of what I was wearing from when I started, I guess, uh, 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 developing as a person, you know, in my early teen years, I still not have this as the same ones, because unfortunately I don't have the same bodies that I had when I was 13 years old. <laughs> you and me both. But nevertheless, I still wear varsity jackets. I have tons of them, some that I've had since I was a kid and many new ones I bought through my life. I have uh, uh, creepers and pointy shoes from my mod years, from when I was 15, 16. I mostly wear vintage clothes uh, in general. And there are a few designers are exceptions to my vintage uh, 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 um, obsession, I guess. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I can say my creeper shoes is one of them. Okay, your creepers are always there. <laughs> They're always there. <laughs> what, so you talked about <laughs> <laughs> you you talked about how you uh, like to buy vintage and, and invest in vintage, but there and that but there is the talk about buying better is more sustainable, um, but and that people want to you know can maybe can't afford to buy you know greatly made pieces. But if you were to tell recommend to anybody, is there one item of clothing or accessory where you say like this is where you save up and invest in a good piece of whatever that might be? What would that piece be for you that you really want to save up for? Oh no, it's a hard question because as you said, I mean in newly made things, really good quality comes with very high price, I believe. Yeah. Ish, ish, because there's a lot of exceptions in everything. Yeah. And even in fast fashion there's some great stuff. Uh, I mean, listen, like everybody else, I, I, the few new things I buy, I buy from, uh, that's Undercover, for example, mm -hmm. Akashi, whom I love, I buy a bit, I, I do buy Japanese whenever, I mean, again, I haven't been in a year in Japan, but I used to go every year, and I would, it's one of the only places I like to shop, because it's more exciting, especially. Yes, me too, me too. Um, uh, I wear Undercover, I wear Uniqlo a lot, but I also buy at Zara. Mm -hmm. And of course, I wear Saint Laurent, because, well, of course, there's no of course, but of course, because I like it, and because I, uh, I have a chance to <laughs> be close to it. Happen to know them. <laughs> but um, but then I also wear some things from Gabrielle Arrest, which are very very high quality and, and, and insanely handwoven. Uh, one of those little white cashmere that she turns into beautiful huge sweaters that you want to leave in uh, twenty four seven and never get out of. And yep. those would probably last all my life. But together with my, I mean, to answer your question, because it's not just about money. Vintage is a solution to money. Mm amazing amazing quality much better of course in craft in vintage whether it's fashion or design um, and, and a much uh, lower price i mean in the cheapest of vintage design stores anywhere in the world you can find amazing finds i mean and everything i like old shoes i yeah. buy old shoes and i find them better because they're worn <laughs> so you'll have to work you know you you yeah, yeah yeah my husband's the same he only but he has a special vintage store that he goes to all the time that I think Hedy Slimane also frequents in the Marais and not, not in the Marais, in the, in the, the, the Puce. Um, and he buys only vintage 1950s jackets, everything. He just buys yeah. it. And they, they last forever. I they mean, last forever. They, 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 they will last forever. And, and there's every level of price, but starting at nothing, at a, a few bucks, you can get a, and especially in America, but in Europe too, you can get a great, you know, a great jacket, a great pair of shoes, whatever, for a few bucks and they'll last forever. All right, next question. Who is your favorite designer, living or dead? Living or dead? Oof, that's a very, very, very wide range. 
Um, I hate, I would hate to say that I don't really have an answer. I can have a group. Uh, I think that's different types of, you, you're talking about fashion, right? Fashion yeah, designers. fashion designers, yeah. Um, I mean, of course, I think the most inventing, groundbreaking, and, and, and many of which I've had the chance to work with, mm -hmm. uh, like John Galliano, uh, like Hussein Shalaya, like uh, Kate and Laura Mulavi, like uh, Jacques Mus today, or, or I think those are, um, but there's many more. I mean, there's, uh, uh, how can I say, my favorite, God, it's complicated. I've worked with Raf, I've worked with, uh, uh, um, this is why I was so excited to ask you because I'm like, this is going to be like. I should, God, I should take back my answer because, in fact, my groupings don't even work the way I'm thinking now. Now, what I was going to say, I say I respect all sorts of talents, and I think you have the, the, the really designing inventive types of fashion designers, such as John or Alexander McQueen uh, 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 or John Galliano, I mean, uh, or Rodate in a different scale. Yeah. That have their own world that they'll apply to anything. and, and then you have more, um, uh, how can I say? Artistic, uh, or well, maybe not, that's not the right word. I'm just well, looking for hand movements. No, no, I'm thinking, of the, you know, I think design, more, more designers of our times that, 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 that shuffle all the trends and all the inspirations and all the references and turns them in very understandable, uh, but, and, and mix all of, uh, in, in, in a broader way, like, like Karl Lagerfeld did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, probably um, Virgil Abloh does today. I mean, in, in, they're similar in a way see, for me in their approach. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I guess that's a, that's a school, and Lee McQueen and John Galeno is another school. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. Yeah. We still, it's two different ty types of schools of approaching the same topic, mm -hmm. and they're both fascinating, even though completely different. And for that reason, I think I can't have a favorite. If I really had to name one, but again, because of the one or few, I mean, I have to say that Ray Kawakubo and Yucha Prada are both, I think, examples, but also because of the longevity mm -hmm. of insane uh, creative talents that have gone through, I don't know how many decades, each one of them, uh, but many, many decades now, <clears throat> exploring many different types of topics and inspirations and trends and, 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 and genders and everything, and it's and still still come up with something that you go wow it's and, so interesting that you say that, that because, that's amazing it's so interesting that you say that because i um the shows that stood out for me this last year were the prada show um visually watching it and then i've been watching from what's been going on in hong kong where i'm seeing come de garçon and junior junior watanabe showing there and, and i'm like oh and it just there's something about them so i yeah, i get you something about them but not just that show we just saw was insane but the fact that it's that it's been 20, 30, yeah. 40 years like that. Yeah. It's insane. It's yeah. insane. Doing the same, doing the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Putting out a collection of clothes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's insane. On the other hand, having said that, well, they both have done a few other things. Ray Kawakubo did a few furniture many years ago, which were amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, did a few fragrances that were groundbreaking when they came out. Yep. And did a few crazy looking stores. Uh, but both her and Mucha, actually, both of them. Yeah. I remember in a Motesando when, and when, when the Comme des Garçons with the round windows opened maybe 20 years ago and right almost at the same time, the, the Prada store uh, that's next to it, that's insane, still 20 years later. Yeah, it's still, still very modern. modern. Yeah. But what I was going to say is that sometimes when I see that, I wish that they could Maybe I'm being silly. I'm, I'm thinking loud, and I, I never, I didn't think of this much before. But maybe one wishes that they could do more creative, different crafts. Maybe that they could let go of doing more clothes because mm -hmm. we know they can do that well. And God knows there's enough of clothes in the world today. And maybe try something completely different. Use the creativity, the talent, and the time and the energy to go design something else, anything, a house, a rocket. Uh, 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 a nap or a plant. I, I don't know. All right. So, Mucha, if you're listening, or Ray, if you're listening, let's see if you can. Let's see what else you can come up with. <laughs> All I right. Let's come up with a lot. I, I mean, I, I, I have the chance to meet both of them, and I'm convinced <coughs> they can come up with a lot. And they continue. It's insane. And and and, and the Mucha with Raf was stunning. I mean, I know. I mean, the the fact that she was answering questions and the. 
I was so excited to have that the, those kind of after show, you yeah. know, rehash outs were amazing. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> final, final two questions. What trend will you never follow? I mean, I hate trends <laughs> to start with. <laughs> okay. I uh, unconsciously probably follow some like we all do. And, uh, and, and but, but I mean, I hate the word never too. Mm -hmm. It would be very apocryphic for me to give you one trend I will never follow. It goes back to what I said at the beginning. You know, if you hated green or red all your lives, there's never, you know, there's no reason you start loving it one day. Mm -hmm. And I still try to love things I didn't like before. So there's nothing I would never like or never do. But on the other hand, I really think that trends, I understand the reason they exist. I think we make them all together unconsciously. Uh, some of them have a reason of existing because the world goes one direction and the trend develops to counter uh, some problems or to help some needs. Mm -hmm. but other than that, fashion trends, eh, they're too short-lived and, 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 and don't really interest me. Okay. Last question. What do you love most about fashion? Um, that's, a, <laughs> that's a complicated question. <laughs> I guess... No, but I guess, I mean, in, in my specific case, what I, what I really sincerely love most about fashion is that the ability, uh, it has the ability and the means it has given me all my life now to do some of maybe my best work and applications of creativity. In other words, again, a lot of the ideas I've had and a lot of the dreams I've had of shows or experiences or things I've created, uh, had I been in the Seattle world, or in the in other world that really excite and interest me more underground the RT world. Some of them, I mean, many other things I might have been able to do that I couldn't do in fashion that would have satisfied me a lot. But many of the big ideas that also satisfied me and I won't hide it, of the grand ideas, have been uh, uh, made possible thanks to fashion. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what I love the most about it. It, it is ultimately a commercial endeavor but with a great artistic need and therefore a great artistic respect. And I've had all the industries of the world, all of the creative industries of the world. I cannot believe today that it is still the one that allows, because it needs it, more creativity at the top. In other words, if you compare to uh, entertainment or to Hollywood, there are amazingly creative movies made in the world today, not that many and very rarely. But never at the top, always yeah. at the beginning. The big, big studio majors are crap. I'm sorry. If you compare to fashion, where not only you have great creatives when they start and they have very little means, but you still have great creation at the very, very top of the biggest groups, the biggest houses, and the biggest designers. And that's very uh, uh, different than the entertainment world, or the music world, or the car world, or the tech world, or any of the other worlds where creativity really only exists at the beginning when there's the money, and then it evaporates and becomes pure commerce. Yeah. In fashion, for some reason, we managed to keep it at the top. It's pretty cool. It is very cool. Alex, mille merci. Thank you so much. I'll let you get back to your family. All right. <laughs> Big kiss. Bye. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye.